Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Ellis and I'm doing a video project on all that I've learned by 28. In this section, I'm going to be talking about raising capital as part of, as the sixth step in the 10 step process of building a company from startup to a million dollars in sales. In the last 10 years, I've had the opportunity to build Eye Contact, and at Eye Contact, we raised $53 million over the course of three rounds of funding. And so I definitely have learned a few lessons about raising venture capital, and I'd like to share them with you in the slides ahead. One of the most important principles about raising capital, at least from my perspective, is to get as far as you can without raising capital. Oftentimes, an entrepreneur will come to me with an interesting idea, but really nothing other than an idea. And he or she will say, I just need $200,000 to get started. And oftentimes, I'll say to that entrepreneur, that's great. However, before you go out and seeking $200,000, which you might be able to raise after nine months of work, you're probably better off incorporating your company, getting your domain name set up, creating business cards, getting your website going, and creating a product prototype. And yes, that will probably take you a few months to do, but if you raise capital after creating an initial product prototype, you'll be able to raise capital at a much higher valuation than if you're just raising capital off an idea alone. And while it's a good time to raise capital here in Silicon Valley, in most places in the United States and around the world, it's very, very challenging to raise capital until you really have a team established in a company that has a product. And so it's important to learn how to bootstrap. Bootstrapping is simply building something from nothing, creating something from nothing. And it's being able to manage resources efficiently. At Eye Contact, we bootstrapped for the first three years of the company from 2003 to 2006. I met my business partner Aaron in October 2002 at the Carolina Entrepreneurship Club's first annual meeting there at UNC Chapel Hill. And we began working right away on turning the creation list builder into IntelliContact, which later became iContact, an email marketing software program. And that next summer of 2003, after my freshman year, I decided to live in the office, sleep on futons, cook on a George Shulman grill. We did everything we had to to keep our expenses low while we built up our revenues and built out our product and built up our customer base. At the end of my first year of college, I had saved up $12,000 to my name and I was living on about $1,000 a month between my car payment and just food. Um, I, at the time, uh, didn't have an apartment. I just simply lived in the office because it was free rent. And I lived on that first year on that $12,000. And we actually deferred our salary for the first three years. And it was a great moment when we got to a million dollars in sales three years later, which contractually uh, stipulated that we would be paid the salary that we had deferred for the first couple of years. And so learning how to bootstrap, learning how to live on just a little bit is very important to entrepreneurial success. And because of, our, because of the fact that we bootstrapped for the first three years, when we finally did raise capital, we were able to raise capital at good terms, when it enabled us to control the company and direct it for years to come. So in the beginning, do whatever it take, takes to keep costs low and make as much progress as you can on as little capital as you can. Even if you have to use some personal funds or funds from friends and family, keep your costs low and get along the path towards success before you go out and raise angel capital or seed investment capital. Now, once you are ready for capital or when you come to a point where you just can't get any further without some additional expenditures, whether you have to pay people or purchase certain intellectual property licenses or purchase hardware, where you look for capital depends on how much you need and how far along you are. And it's a question that I often get asked via email or Facebook from entrepreneurs, especially aspiring first-time entrepreneurs. And so I've created on this next slide what I call the matrix of green. And this is where to look for capital depending on how much you need and at what stage you are. And so if you're looking for less than $25,000, Credit cards, your personal savings, friends and families are great places to look. Now, some people say, well, I'm just starting my company and I'm going to apply for a $10,000 loan from a bank. And what we found at Eye Contact and what most people find is that unless they have an asset to securitize that loan, to provide collateral in case you default on that loan, it's often very difficult to get a loan until you have 
revenue. Once you have revenue, and especially once you have profits, banks will lend you a lot. And as the saying goes, money is only available when you don't need it. So banks are often the most conservative institutions, and thankfully they are a little bit conservative, which enables us to be able to safely deposit our life savings with them. So initially, you really need to start with credit cards, your savings, and friends and family. Now, once you're looking for more than $25,000, let's say after you've built your initial product prototype and after you have a couple of employees that are working for sweat equity, then you can start going out to angel investors and super angels. Angel investors are high net worth individuals that will invest, say, between $25,000 and $500,000 in your company in exchange for an ownership interest in your business. Now that can be done through an equity investment or something called convertible debt, which is a short-term loan that is turned into equity if and when the company raises further venture capital through a Series A offering of shares at an inst through an institutional firm, like a venture capital fund. Super angels are just super high net worth individuals, whereas most angels might be hard pressed to put in more than 50K. Uh, oftentimes I've seen super angels who are able to invest $500,000 or even a million dollars in a venture. Now these are often people with lots of assets who have the ability to put a million dollars into a venture with that being say 1% or less of their total assets. Now getting to know those super angels and angels is often quite difficult and it takes some time networking in your community and talking to other entrepreneurs who have been successful and raised capital before and building relationships with them. Oftentimes you can go to venture capital conferences or you can go to uh, other conferences that bring together different investors with pitches or you can go through an incubator program like Techstars or Y Combinator in order to connect with different angels and super angels. Now, once you've raised your seized round of funding and you've perhaps gotten to the point where you have users and maybe even have customers and you have your product and you're ready to raise half a million dollars or more, that's when you can start going to early stage venture capital funds. And I'll talk more about raising venture capital in just a moment. As you go into say your series B, your second round of, or third round of funding, and you need between five million and $25 million, something called growth stage venture capital and mezzanine debt opens up to you. And then after you've really built out your product and you're, you have more than say 20 or $30 million in revenue, you're five or six years in, you, and you're looking for more than $25 million, going to late stage venture capital funds and private equity shops is often possible. Now, if you ever end up needing more than $50 million, which will probably only happen if you're trying to do something very technologically complex, or if you're a large company that is a public company and publicly traded, then you can go to large private equity funds, uh, public markets like NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange and sell shares to the public in exchange for investment in your company. You can do a private investment in a public entity or a pipe through an investment bank, or you can issue corporate bonds, which are interest-bearing notes from large companies through an investment bank. Now, regardless of where you seek capital, a rule of thumb that I think is an important one for most companies to follow is to do your best to avoid raising too much money. And my rule of thumb is don't raise more than one times your current annualized revenue. Now, that may not be possible before you have a product. You might need $100,000 or $200,000 before you actually get to the point where you have any revenue, maybe even a little bit more. But once you have revenue, let's say you have revenue of $500,000 a year, then I wouldn't raise too much more money until you have gotten the, your revenue increased. And so at iContact, we actually followed this. We bootstrapped for the first three years. Then when we had $1 million in revenue in 2005, we raised $500,000 from Idea Fund Partners there in Durham, North Carolina. In 2006, a year later, we had grown our revenues from $1 million to a little over $5 million. And we used that initial capital to ramp up our online advertising and really build out our executives. And we went out and raised $5.3 million from Updata Partners in our Series A. So we had our seed round from Idea Fund Partners and then our Series A from Updata Partners. And we still had followed that rule of raising less than 1x our annualized revenue. Then in 2010, when our revenues were just over $40 million, we raised a $40 million round of funding from JMI Equity. But actually some of that round went to early shareholders and investors, and then most of that round went to the company itself. So all along the way, we raised a total of about $53 million. 
And then in 2012, when we sold the company to Vocus, we were about 48 or $49 million in revenue. And so we followed this rule of no more than 1x our current annualized revenue as we grew. And what it did is it ensured we maintained control of the company and it allowed us to have leverage and negotiating power as we structured and negotiated each of our term sheets with the three or four investors that we had. So your negotiating power is based on a number of factors. Things like the, how, the level of need for the money, how much you need it, your experience, whether you've been through this before, whether you've built a company or been a C-level executive before and had a successful exit, the people around you and their experience, the product and technology, the market, the competition, the, and the, particularly the competition for your funding. So if you have other term sheets, oftentimes you can greatly increase the valuation and greatly improve the quality of those terms. And then the quality of your advisors. So whereas it might be fashionable to go out and raise a $10 million round before you even get started, and it might even be attractive if you could say raise $10 million on a $10 million valuation and only give up half of your company in order to get to the point where you can have all that money in the bank and be able to start generating uh, a number of jobs and employees, I often advise you to take a little bit of time in the first couple years and get your product to market, get a prototype to market, rapidly improve and do rapid prototyping, and get a minimal viable product out into the marketplace and get some user feedback. It's too often I see companies raise 10, 20, 30 million dollars before they even have revenue or before they even have millions of users. And I would encourage you to avoid that if you want to control your company and control your own destiny. Now, when you receive investment proposals from venture capital funds, you get what's called a term sheet. And a term sheet is a summary of a desire to invest in your company and the terms at which they want to invest. The most important terms on the term sheet are terms like valuation, option pool size, liquidation preferences, founder revesting, veto rights, the type of preferred stock, whether it's straight preferred or participating preferred, and the number of board seats. Now, many entrepreneurs think that valuation is the most important term and that the highest valuation is the best valuation. What I've realized in my experience as an entrepreneur is that valuation is an important term, but only one of many important terms, and that you shouldn't simply take the term sheet with the highest valuation on it. Oftentimes, there is other structuring in the term sheet or other terms that end up affecting the true return and the, of the investor and the true cost of capital for your firm. Oftentimes, you also want to factor in things like firm reputation and firm access to IPO markets and firm experience in, in, in addition to the terms in the term sheet. Now, what, I'm going to go briefly go through each of these terms to describe what they are. Valuation is simply the price at which a firm is going to invest in your company. And so if they're investing $5 million at a $10 million valuation, they'll end up owning approximately one-third of the stock. Now, because they basically invested $5 million into a company that's now worth $15 million. Option pool size is the required size of additional stock that the venture fund requires you to create in order to provide incentive structures for future employees that come into the company. In an early stage company, in an early stage investment, a venture fund might require an option pool as high as 15 or 25 percent. In later stage investments, was particularly once you have revenue and you're going after your Series B or Series C, so oftentimes those option pool requirements are closer to 1 to 5 percent. Liquidation preferences simply means that in the case of company liquidity, in other words, if the company is liquidated and it goes bankrupt and the remaining assets are turned into cash, who gets those assets first? And oftentimes liquidation preferences are dealing with the downside scenario. In a capitalization table, which is simply or a capitalization chart, which is simply a chart of accounts for who has put in money in the form of equity and debt into a company and who owns shares in that company, oftentimes the debt providers are senior to the equity providers. And what that means is that in the case of bankruptcy, the people that provided debt, the creditors, get their money out before the people that provide equity. And for most investors, it's important for them to be as high in the cap chart as possible. And so they often make their investment preferred investments that are senior in the cap table to common investors who have basically common stock, which are generally the employees of the company. 
And so who gets their money out first is an important term for you to negotiate on your term sheet. Founder revesting of shares is also an important topic. When you as a founder have worked at a firm for a handful of years, you often earn your equity over time. When you provide options and stock to employees and to founders, oftentimes you will provide it over the course of four years. So in an example, if you were to be earning 40% of a company's stock over four years, you might get, you'd probably get in that case get 10% every year, maybe on a monthly or quarterly basis. And so sometimes uh, investors will restart the clock on your vesting of shares and force you to revest. And I often find that in many cases to be unfair to the founders who have already earned part of their shares. An important topic to look at and negotiate is veto rights. Veto rights are simply what an investor can say no to and what they can stop you from doing. And it's common for investors to have a veto right on something like a sale of the company or the issuance of a lot of new debt. But you really want to look at what they can block, particularly if there is a block on a merger and acquisition. You don't want a minority investor or a minority shareholder to be able to block a deal that's beneficial to the large majority of your shareholders. You also want to look at prefer the type of preferred stock. There is um, straight preferred and there's something called participating preferred. And there's a world of difference in terms of how much return your investors get and how much your capital costs. So make sure you look up what participating preferred means and try to avoid it and stick with straight preferred as much as possible. And then finally, it's the number of board seats. Board seats are critical in terms of control of the company. And if you have a five-person board of directors and you and your other co-founders and people you know and trust have three of those five seats, then effectively you control the company, particularly if you as the majority owner of common stock as the entrepreneur or as a team of co-founders can appoint those seats. When you start raising investment, however, oftentimes the investors will want one or more board seats depending on the amount of money they're putting in. And you have to be careful because if you give up the majority of the board seats or the majority of the rights to appoint the board seats, which is really the important part, you will end up at being at risk of other people besides yourself being able to make decisions in your company and even let you go as CEO. So particularly if you're a first time CEO, be very careful with giving up board seats because the last thing you want to do is put years into building your baby and then have some investors who don't see eye to eye with you be able to let you go from your own company. Now there's some factors besides what's on the term sheet in selecting your investors. One of the most important ones is just your ability to get along with the partner, chemistry. The partner in this case is the person who's going to be joining your board of directors who's going to serve as your chief mentor during this process. You also want to look at the partner's operational experience. In most venture capital funds, most of the partners don't have operating experience. When that means, what that means is they haven't run a business or even been part of a C-level team. They have often simply been investors. They've been financiers. And while investors do get good experience in seeing lots of different examples of companies over their time being on different boards, if you haven't run a company, you can't understand what it's like to be an entrepreneur and you can't understand the nuance of the important components of mentoring a new entrepreneur up. And so I'd encourage you to only take money from partners who have operational experience or if you're taking money from a fund um, that has partners that have some operational experience and then partners who don't, make sure that the partner joining your board has operational experience or at least the one that's going to be serving as your primary mentor. You also want to look at alignment with the investments, other investments, which is called their portfolio. Are there firms in their portfolio that you can partner with or potentially sell to someday? You'll want to look at successful exits from that firm and from the partner at that firm that's going to join your board of directors. How many exits north of $100 million has that partner personally been part of? How many exit north, no, exits north of $100 million has that firm been part of? If you're looking at raising capital from a fund that's had fewer than, say, 10 investments turn into exits north of $100 million, then that firm is either very new or they simply are not that good of a firm. Um, in terms of executive recruiting, that's really building your team and that is at the lifeblood of your likelihood of success. And so look for funds and look for firms that have a network of operational executives at the CFO level, the COO level, or even someday the CEO level that they can bring in to help your company grow. And then finally, the terms of the investment which we covered before. Let's talk about valuation guidelines for a pre-revenue company. Now, 
evaluation can range all over the place, depending on many factors. At a tech company or a software company or a life sciences company, a company that has a huge potential in the future, a pre-revenue, that is before you get any users, customers, and revenue, valuation might be between $1 million at the low end and as high as $25 million, depending on factors like the CEO's past exits and results, the team experience, the number of current user base, the number of engineers in the company, and the location in the company. And oftentimes, if you're in Silicon Valley between San Jose and San Francisco, the valuations are often double what they are in other parts of the world. So here's an example. Let's take a company that's a business-to-consumer tech company, and it's run by a first-time entrepreneur with one engineer. Their pre-money valuation is going to be pretty low, between $1 and $2 million. That doesn't necessarily mean the company's worth $1 to $2 million. That simply means that some people would be willing to invest at that valuation in order to take a chance that your company will be worth much more in the future. Now let's take a second example where a company is run by first-time entrepreneurs but they've been through a good incubator like Y Combinator and they have a good idea and a couple engineers. Now you can see just in say the six months it took to go through the incubator and refine the idea and get an extra engineer they've more than quadrupled the value of their company because many companies will often get stuck in the first six months and end up going nowhere. And so now you can raise money at say four to eight million dollars in valuation even for pre-revenue company. Now let's take an example of a company run by an experienced CEO who has 10 years of executive C-level experience, has had an exit north of $100 million, and has five engineers already working. Now you're talking about a pre-money valuation closer to 10 to $20 million. Not necessarily because the company is worth that much today, because arguably it's not as the valuation is really just present value of future cash flows. But the reality is, is that many people will take a risk that that entrepreneur will be able to build a company to be worth much more than 10 or $20 million in the future, and therefore might invest $10 million on a $20 million valuation for one-third ownership in the company. And so post-revenue guidelines are, of course, different than pre-revenue. And oftentimes, they're based on revenue multiples. And that revenue multiple might range from 1x at the low end to, say, 12x at the high end based on factors like the amount of revenue, the revenue growth rate, the number of users and customers, whether the revenue is recurring revenue, services revenue, or product revenue, the experience of the team and CEO, the market you're playing in, and the location, of course, of your company. Location is critically important because not only does it enable you to attract better employees and executives if you're in the right location, but it also enables you to access better IPO and M&A markets where you can have greater firms that can densely uh, congregate in a way that enables you to have a much likelier chance of eventually exiting the company. And so as you go about your fundraising process, generally you want to create a competitive process. And so you need to build a pipeline of potential investors, have a number of meetings, often 20 or 30 meetings within a period of two to three weeks. You need to oftentimes have those meetings six to nine months before you're really ready to run your process and then have those meetings again when you're ready to run the process. And you want to build your funding process to ensure that within say a week time period, you receive multiple term sheets. Oftentimes when you get a term sheet, it will only be what, what is called enforceable or valid for just a few days. And so you need to drive different firms toward the same timeline and create competitive uh, process so that you can increase your valuation and get better terms. And so when you begin negotiating valuation as you get these term sheets, you need to have comparables fresh in your head. And what I mean by that is valuations of similar firms that are just like yours or comparable to yours at least similar venture capital deals, similar exits and M&A deals, and then public companies that play in a similar space to yours. And you want to look at their revenue multiples and their profit multiples if you are at the point where you have uh, profits as well. Now if you're pre-revenue, you'll want to look at similar venture deals that have happened in your area that that fund has done or other funds has done. So you get an idea. Now at the same time, it's important to note that you don't want to take a valuation that's too high. That's a mistake I've seen many entrepreneurs make. When they have a choice between raising capital at a $20 million valuation or a $40 million valuation, there's obviously a huge temptation to raise money at the much higher valuation because then you give up less ownership in your company and you're diluted less. But what happens when you raise money at too inflated of a valuation? 
Too often, what happens after that is that the pressure that, are, that is coming from your investors to produce a return for their limited partners and general partners in their fund ends up driving you nuts and ends up creating a stressful environment where you can't be productive. And so oftentimes it is good to optimize and maximize your valuation, create a competitive process and com com create great terms, but don't push your investors to increase their valuation too hard. Otherwise, when they get to the other side of the table, you're suddenly gonna find investors who are under a lot of stress and that doesn't make your life that easy. So raise money from smart people you really like because ultimately, you're more or less going to be married to them, metaphorically speaking, of course, for the next three to 10 years until they get their money back or you go bankrupt. And so the, the sort of summarizing this advice is wait to raise your series A, raise just a small seed round until you have proven mathematically that in a certain amount of invested dollars received brings that amount times a multiple in dollars back. Don't raise money until you know how you're going to use it and you'll end up controlling your destiny and controlling your company and being able to be much more creative with a lot less stress in your life. It's really important to calculate your unit economics before you raise multiple millions of dollars of venture financing. And what I mean by that is you wanna figure out how much it costs to acquire an additional customer in advertising cost. And if you can take your total ad spend and divide that by your total number of new customers per month that you're adding, that is your customer acquisition cost. And as I'll talk about in the upcoming section on marketing, when you understand how much it costs to acquire an additional customer and how much it costs to produce an additional unit of whatever you're selling, and how much you earn from that customer over that customer's lifetime in revenue and profits, you'll be able to be ready to raise venture capital at a, a Series A or Series B level because at that point, you'll be able to know that $10 of investment in will generate $50 in revenue out and it'll be a worthwhile use of capital. At the end of the day, equity capital or venture capital is the most expensive type of capital you can raise. So only raise what you need and make sure you know what you're going to use it for before you take it on. Thanks for watching this section on venture capital, raising funding, and bootstrapping.